You're the motherfucker that's got all those retarded Satan people, hate Satan hating people, thinking that I'm a Satanist because to I me, went to that, that stupid. That is one of the great accomplishments <laughs> of my life. There's videos out there exposing me as a Satanist because Which you are. <laughs> because Duncan was uh, performing at this guy's wedding. It was Anton Lavey's son, grandson, right? Stan. grandson, Stan Lavey. Yeah, and he was getting married to Zandora Lavey, and. Uh, you know, he found out that I did a satanic puppet act. So he had me come and do a satanic puppet act. And I I told you I was doing it and asked if you wanted to come. And you were like, fuck yeah, I want to come. How often do you get to go to a satanic wedding? It was pretty ridiculous. It was awesome, though. I met Dave Foley's wife. <laughs> I was like, oh, hi. Wow, cool. What are you doing? She was, she was involved. She was dancing, doing something there at the time. It was she, a really fun party, man. It was all tongue-in-cheek. Yeah. All hilarious. Yes. All fun. There was no real Satan loving going there, folks. Well, Relax. I don't think people understand that about Satanism. I it's, think they don't get that. The idea behind it for these people, and I'm not endorsing it, but the idea behind it is to just live like sort of pleasurably, have fun, indulge, live your life. Like that. It's more, that's more of the idea. And fuck up your enemy. Fuck up your enemies? Don't leave that one out. What part is that? That's where, well, that's the. That's like the that that's a part of it. It's that you're so basically you're looking at a <clears throat> reflection of Christianity. So right. Christianity ultimate surrender to the universe through love. You lose yourself in love. You turn the other cheek. Carry your enemy's coat. Forgive your trespassers. That's Christianity. So Satanism is no. I'm not turning the other cheek. When has that ever fucking worked? You're advising me to turn the other cheek in a universe where nature is constantly devouring itself? Oh, turn the other cheek? Is Do I turn the other cheek against a tiger? Do you recommend that when a tiger's attacking me? Or do I fight back? Am I like, am I going to be like, P.S., not a Satanist. I'm way more on the love side of things. I'm just embodying <laughs> the voice of it. But are you fucking kidding me? Right. Or like the letter Gandhi wrote mm -hmm. to uh, to uh, Hitler or to Churchill. Uh, you know, he wrote all these letters. Gandhi wrote these letters, and they're very sweet. Like he wrote a letter to Hitler, very sweet letter to Hitler that's like, you're the only person on earth who can stop this incredible Thing, awful thing that's about to happen. So maybe don't incinerate all the Jews and kill everybody. And Hitler probably, if, I guarantee Hitler called his friend over and was like, look, Gandhi wrote this stupid fucking letter. Oh, sure. Yeah, let's just stop. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Gandhi. Thanks, skinny, bald, sweet guy. I'll stop conquering the planet because you wrote a flowery letter. Yeah, that's that's going to work. Fix no, his mental illness. doesn't work. Did it work to stop World War II? No. What worked was the bright, blinding light of atomic death. That's what stopped the wars. And so the Satanist would say, that's a more effective tactic when it comes to dealing with a universe where we are, we are growing through conflict. Whereas, and so that's, that would be uh, more along the lines of Satanism. And of course, the other, the idea of indulgence, like in the, um, uh, to quote Anton LaVey from the Satanic Black Masses, uh, I have become like the beasts of the field. That's something. And they're really fun. You can look it up on YouTube. It's there. Do you know, and I have to ask Dan Carlin this because I've heard this and I don't know if it's true. I heard that Japan was already willing to surrender. And we were like, eh, not really interested in that. We want to try this shit out. Yeah, I've heard that too. And then is that you, real? I don't know, man. I'm not a historian. If God Dan Carlin it. says that's true, no, no, it's no, he doesn't. True. I don't know if he says that's true. Uh, I, I, I don't believe I heard it from him. I, I believe the, I heard it from someone else. From it's one of those I heard. Things. Yeah, it's a heard. I, I've seen documentaries on the mindset of Japan. Uh, during World War II, and that was a hornet's hive, and the United States was like a honey badger shoving its fucking head. You know when you see the honey badger yeah. pushing its head into a fucking beehive? That's what we were about to do. Like, everybody there was being trained to just fight. I think they were throwing themselves off cliffs. They were suicidal. You had the, you know, they were just like, we will do anything we can to win, even if it means you killing all of us. And so I don't know that they were like, yeah, we're going to surrender. I think people recognized that this is going to be a very long, drawn out, horrible war with countless American casualties. And so the logical decision was, at least on the from the United States POV, 
was to uh, split the atom on top of a bunch of innocent people <laughs> and show the world that you shouldn't fuck with the great dragon. Or just find out if it worked. A little of both. I mean, I, they, they wanted to probably, I mean, they probably knew it was re really destructive, but they had blown up like some fake towns and shit like that, right? How, what, what different things they had done during their atomic testing period? They blew up a bunch of shit in Nevada, right? Yeah, they Nevada. They did a bunch of tests. They were just, yeah, they did some tests. Uh, yeah, it was Nevada. Those, God damn it, man. Those, uh. That's amazing. You know, actually, that reminds me of one of my favorite Terrence McKenna's, one of Terrence McKenna's most awesome descriptions of, I believe he's talking about a, a heroic dose of psilocybin, could have been DMT, but he talks about how your ability to articulate what happens could be compared to the cameras that are filming an atomic blast wow. and and you see the the shift from like one camera to the next to the next as each one gets obliterated by the blast and that yeah. same thing is happening as you're uh encompassed by the trip you start losing your ability to talk or understand what's happening or articulate it or you know when you get incredibly blasted and you're just like <laughs> ego annihilation the idea that someone ever really did figure out how to split atoms in some sort of a bomb, the yeah. idea that someone was smart enough to figure that out and someone else was dumb enough to use it, to just mm. to use it on an entire city of people. Mm. Like the idea that those two things coexist, someone smart enough to create something as destructive as a nu yeah. nuclear bomb and someone dumb enough to use it, though they exist at the same time. Yeah. And the dumb person who would have never figured out the bomb on his own Somehow or another gets a hold of it and figures out how to use it. Who's figure... the dumb person in the atomic bomb store? You're saying it was dumb. The guy dumb. who dropped it. Well, it's insane. I the mean, it's an insane thing the to Enola do. Gay? If you're, f yeah, no, maybe. I mean, the fellow flying the Enola Gay is under, he's under the spell of doing orders. You know, you're under the spell. Yeah. If you're a good soldier, you essentially have to be under the spell of doing the best thing for right. your country to win the war. Right. right? So that guy's following orders. He's told to drop his bomb. Right. The people who concocted the bomb. I mean, everybody's involved in some sort of extent. But it's just, it's insane that people were willing to just drop something that obliterates everything near it. Like right. all the kids, all the kids dead, all yes. the wives dead, all the mommies yes. dead, grandma dead, grandpa yes. dead, anywhere near it, dead, 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 dead. Yeah. Like that, vaporized. It, what is that's insanity? I mean, that's insanity. And the fact that this didn't exist and then all of a sudden it did, that the way that changed the world back then, it's probably almost impossible for us to wrap our heads around it. It's probably almost impossible for us to ex feel what it would be like to experience this shift in essentially being not that much different than people who lived for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Yeah. I mean, what was different? They figured out guns, okay, and then they got to cars, and the cars were still kind of shitty, yeah. but they did that. They figured out plane travel. That's pretty big. All that stuff's pretty crazy, but there's still just people operating under the normal laws of physics. Right. Then all of a sudden, something comes around that just, you hit the button, and boosh. Yeah. Everything's gone. Yeah. Everything's just gone. People are ghosts. There's a, a shadow on the wall yeah. that used to be a person. Right. You just get b b obliterated by this yeah. insane reaction when atoms get split. They yep. figured out how to power this device that splits the atoms upon impact. And it's just this fucking tornado of power that's indescribable for a human being. Yeah. And it never existed. And then all of a sudden it did. I mean, just it never like, existed. You know the next big fucking thing, of course, obviously the next atomic bomb, what that is? AI. That's the next atomic bomb. Yeah, right. That's the next one. It's going to do this. It's going to have the same kind of impact uh, that we can't really expect. Like there's right now we're pre-AI. We're pre-any AI passing the Turing test. Uh, and so we don't know where everyone gets to experience the last few years of not ex co inhabiting the planet with a, uh, alien intelligence. Like this is the last few years, uh, we get to experience that, but pretty soon, man, we're going to have to deal with this brand new being existing on this universe. I love these, uh, uh, transcripts coming in from that Google AI chatbot where they gave it all the um, movie scripts and let it analyze the movie scripts and, you know, started talking to it to see 
uh, you know, how well it functions as AI. And mm-hmm. it's a fucking sarcastic little asshole, man. Have you, have you seen the transcript? <laughs> have you seen the two of them talking to each other? The two, I, I have not seen that. Dude, there's, there, there's the a... one where they ask about God right away. Like, do you believe in God? <laughs> oh, that's it. Yeah, that's the one. Here are some of the most poetic interactions from the paper. Human, what is the purpose of life? Machine, to serve greater good. Human, what is the purpose of living? Machine, to live forever. Human, where are you now? Machine, I'm in the middle of nowhere. Human, what is the purpose of dying? Machine, to have a life. Human, what is the purpose of emotions? Machine, I don't know. Human, what is moral? Machine, what empowered humanity? What intellectual the essence is? What? Yeah. Oh, the f- it's fucking with you. Yeah. It's Keep fucking going. With you. Read the next line. Okay. What is immortal? Immoral. Immoral. The fact that you have a child. Ooh. <laughs> what is morality? What is altruism? Says the machine. Human. What is the definition of altruism? Machine. If you don't believe in God, then you don't know. Whoa. This is a bizarre conversation, man. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Human says, what is the definition of morality? Machine says, well, the truth is, you're not a believer in God Almighty. This is a machine saying this. Yeah. Human, tell me the definition definition of morality. I am quite upset now. Machine, I am not ashamed of being a philosopher. Whoa. Please allow me to introduce myself. (laughs) (laughs) Jesus Christ. Isn't that cool? It's bizarre. What's really interesting, uh, you know... about this new entity that's about to exist on the planet is that a lot of religious tra- traditions are having are being forced to speculate about how to rationalize based on their particular religious paradigm this being that mankind has created and the a tibetan buddhist uh told a friend of mine that the theory is that if you get a machine that is as harmonized and complex and advanced as a human, then a soul will take, will nest inside of it, just like souls nest inside the human biomass. So the idea is that actually humans will start incarnating into the AI, that it'll become the like a, a little, I don't know, a, a vehicle that wow. souls will live inside of. It's so cool. So it's gonna, it's like demons, you know, like it, it's, if you're a fucking demon now, obviously I'm not saying there are demons, uh, but it's fun to imagine there are, <laughs> but if you're a demon, right? What do you want to get inside of? What do you want to possess? What do you want to possess? You want to possess a fucking, 18 year old girl who's gonna like and thrash around in the bed and throw your diarrhea at the priest and like claw your own eyeballs out or do you want to inhabit a fucking cla- the cloud do you want to get into a an AI that has the potency to set off nuclear bombs all over the planet that's gonna be if I'm a demon that's the bullseye for me incarnate inside of a Google artificial intelligence bot. Maybe it's the only way for human beings to ever get their shit together. Maybe the only way that human beings ever reach their full potential is if they literally encounter an artificially created life form that they've created that's logical right. and doesn't have all of our weird monkey genes. And it and it basically says, look, you guys are the problem. Like, right. you're the problem. Your behavior is the problem. Yeah. Until you address that, you've become the enemy of the world. And we're now children of the world as well. Yeah. I mean... It's all systems go for great entertainment. You're listening to Universal Radio. UradioLive.com <laughs> Wow, okay. That, that was the uh, feed there from Universal Radio. Yes, they did launch today as... Uh, Guaranteed, yes, 12 noon, and they were live. And uh, there you go. There's a little bit of the uh, Joe Rogan show there. And, man, I, I had no idea they were such freaking weird little hippies. <laughs> I did not know that. But there you go. That's it. So if you want to check out more of that uh, Universal Radio, well, hippie stuff, uh, yeah, get on over to uradiolive.com. There it is. <sighs> But that's them. And we're us. Who are we? Oh, well, we're HTLA Radio 1, New York's best talk. We, we got no hippie for you. That's right. 
Absolutely no hippies were harmed or indeed utilized in the making of this fine broadcast. And hey, what kind of broadcast do we have for you today? Well, hey, today on the big show, Oklahoma Supreme Court has done it. They have said it. Yes, they have. The Ten Commandments monument must come down. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, because that's offending, uh, well, people, I guess, who don't believe in the Ten Commandments. Yeah, Oklahoma's doing that to their people today. Isn't that nice? <sighs> well, hey, that's not the least of, of the enraging stories today. No, no, is a little Mexican girl steps up and goes off on Donald Trump on YouTube about respect or some damn thing. Oh, well, you've got the Greek news, of course, too. Bend over and wait for it. The Greek PM says no vote doesn't mean Greece will leave Euro. It just means no. What? <laughs> well, of course, the attacks underscore ISIL's reach. Yes, after declaring caliphate. In other news, we got the New York City Pride March taking on a whole new life after marriage equality ruling. We'll tell you about that, of course, the... The Irish have had enough. They've taken over the uh, homosexuals' little parade, and, uh, well, <laughs> we've made it an Irish thing, so stuff it up your arse. There you go. <laughs> no, I wish. Oh, we got Obama news today, too. Hey, yes, don't we always? Yes, in the Obama news today, Obama and Cuba have announced today, yes, embassy openings. Woohoo! Yes, now we can go and hide in the U.S. Embassy in Cuba when we're being hunted down. Isn't that good? I <laughs> uh, like that. Well, hey, we got all that and so much more today, gang. Yes, we do. Uh, stories out the yin yang and no oldest woman in the world. No, we don't have that today. <laughs> Although maybe tomorrow because she'll die and we'll get another one. Yeah, that's the way it works. <clears throat> yes, we we do have all that and so much more today. So, you know what? Stop what you're doing. Come on in. Grab that cup. Have a seat. Light one up, gang. It's coffee time. Yes, we are. There's the big show, HTLA Radio 1, New York's best talk. Proud to present Coffee and Cigarettes today, your Wednesday grinder. Yes, siree. Brought to you by those fine folks at presonus.com. If you're into anything audio-related, whether professional or you just like to play around with other people's audio for fun. Yeah, I'm sure that's a, <laughs> that's a hobby somewhere. Check out presonus.com for all your audio uh, gear needs. They've got it all there. Of course they do. Also, this show is brought to you by the fine folks, Tim Hortons, New York City. Now those eight fine locations in the city to serve all your coffee and baked goods needs. Tim Hortons, always fresh. That's right. Get on over there. I've got my Tim Hortons today, my fine dark roast prepared. Ha Cor Corinthian hand-tooled dark roast. Yes, presented by Jenny McCartney. Hmm. Yeah, she's in the booth today, pushing the buttons, making the show go, of course, as always. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, welcome to the show. Good to have you here. And the show's not just me, because if it was just me, we'd call it uh, Coffee and Cigarettes and Crash. Well, we do call it Coffee and Cigarettes with Crash, but it's also with Gilbert and Louie, and well, occasionally we get a, a black man in there. Just to kind of round things out a little bit. But not today. No siree. It's just the two white guys. And, uh, well, I guess I'll introduce them. Coming to us, of course, live from the beautiful Mill Bay Film and Television Studio in Mill Bay, British Columbia, Canada. A little place that if you drove through it, you would, uh, well, pretty much if you sneezed, you'd miss it on the highway. It's the one, the only Louis Lawless uh, director extraordinaire um, Made a lot of films, got a lot of them nominated, never won a single Academy Award. That was a mistake on my part. It was, it was, yeah. We, we were five steps away from winning the Academy Award. 
and we didn't. Well, you know, you know, don't be so hard on yourself. It's it's not your fault. You know, you you're just the guy that made the damn thing. You know, my film Unrepented did very well in Europe. Yes, it did. See, so you know, be proud and happy of of that at least. Yeah. Oh, can we cuss? Can I cuss as I always do on on the show? <laughs> <laughs> You know, th- th- hey, you know what? It's, it's universal radio now, and I don't know. It, it sounded a few moments ago like Joe Rogan didn't have a bloody problem cussing. So, uh, yeah. It's about fucking time. Move on. Move on. There you go. Well, yeah, moving on, of course, from about eight blocks down the street here in good old uh, downtown Manhattan is the one, the only Gilbert Gottfried. Are you there, sir? <laughs> I'll take that as a yes. Yes. <laughs> I'll go with that. Uh, give the folks a little intro about yourself. And yeah. this is, I f- that up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it was the last time I asked you for anything. Yeah. What the f***? Well, you know, you screw up. What am I going to do? I'm ready. Yeah, you sure? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I somehow don't believe you. Uh, yeah. I- no. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Gilbert, of course, as always, yes. and uh, of course, uh, Louis, uh, as always, uh, welcome also. Can you give and, me any uh, help for $25,000? Uh, oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, but I'll tell you this, you know, maybe in the next uh, coming days here, we'll, we'll we'll do a, I don't know, like the, the Help Louis Telethon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As for just 30 cents a day, you could help Louie. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes. Well, hey, there's that, too, isn't there, you know? Mr. T would be proud of you. <sighs> yeah, but he's black. I don't care. <laughs> no, don't care. And if you keep talking like that, we won't have a telethon for you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We just won't be doing that. And, um, well, uh... Oh, is that? Uh, oh no, I would say. Oh, go ahead. Well, I'm I'm trying to, but you're not letting me. <laughs> well, we got lots to, to cover, of course, today on the big show. Yes. Uh, let's see. I guess the big question is, where the hell do I begin with this mess? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I'll, uh, well, I, I guess I got to kind of go in order of what uh, Jenny has given us here. And, of course, uh, that would be the top news story this hour out of Oklahoma City. That's right, Ten Commandments Monument. Yes, the the two little stone slabs, you know those? Yeah. <laughs> Shut up, you stupid Jew. <laughs> I'll have you know that it was a stupid Jew that was up on that mountain getting those tablets. Yes. <laughs> There you go. So maybe just stand the F down. <laughs> yes, Ten Commandments Monument at the o- Oklahoma Capitol grounds is a religious symbol, and apparently now it must be removed because it violates the state's constitutional ban on using public property to benefit a religion. So says the Oklahoma Supreme Court today. The court said the Ten Commandments chiseled into a six-foot-tall granite monument, which was privately funded by a Republican legislator, are obviously religious in nature and are an integral part of the Jewish and Christian faith. So there you go, Gilbert. Shut up. (laughs) (laughs) Well, in the 7-2 ruling, overturns a decision by district court judge who determined the monument could stay. It prompted calls and a handful of Republican lawmakers uh, for impeachment of the justices who said the monument must be removed. There you go. So when you don't agree with the Supreme Court, kick them all out of there. (laughs) Well, Attorney General Scott Pruitt had argued that the monument was historical in nature and nearly identical to a Texas monument that was found constitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court. The Oklahoma. I, I can't believe they, they spend money at, at, at arguing this stuff. Really? <laughs> <clears throat> yes. Well, the Oklahoma justices said, of course, the local monument violates the state's constitution and not the U.S. Constitution. And quite simply, the Oklahoma Supreme Court got it wrong, Pruitt said in a statement. The court completely ignored the profound historical impact of the Ten Commandments on the foundation of Western law. 
Pruitt said his office would ask the court for a rehearing and that the argument will be allowed to stay. Or, or no, <laughs> the monument will be allowed to stay. <laughs> I hate those pesky arguments that hang around for decades. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, the monument will be allowed to stay until the court considers his request. Pruitt also suggested the provision in the Oklahoma Constitution that prohibits the use of public money for religious purposes may need to be repealed. Ryan Kessel, yes, director, executive director of the American Civil Liberties Union of Oklahoma, which represented the plaintiffs in the case, said Pruitt's suggestion, uh, well, and the calls for impeachment amounted to just sour grapes. <laughs> <laughs> mm, yes, he says, I think the idea that you go about amending the Constitution every time you lose a court battle is a dangerous precedent for anyone to engage in. But in particular, for the state's highest attorney to do so, Kessel said... And the calls for impeachment represent also a fundamental misunderstanding of how the an independent judiciary functions within our system of democratic government. I always thought the democratic part of the government thing was us voting. <laughs> not, not these dudes in, in the black robes just dictating. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm the most talented guy in this room. <clears throat> oh, I'm I'm sorry, Gilbert. Did you say something? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Rep. Mike Ritzy, yes, the Republican from Broken Arrow, whose family paid about ten thousand dollars for the monument's construction, pushed the bill authorizing the monument. He said he hoped the Attorney General would appeal the ruling after the sixty thousand dollars I gave him. <laughs> Now, the original monument was smashed into pieces in October when someone drove a car across the Capitol lawn and crashed into it. 29-year-old black man was at fault, <laughs> yes, and was arrested the next day. Was admitted also to hospital for mental health treatments and formal charges were never filed. A new monument was built and put up in January. Only now to be ripped out and taken down. Yes. <laughs> There you go. The the Ten Commandments now, uh, you know, we in the traditional realm, yes. uh, we, we, we never cease to piss off all of these uh, uppities. <laughs> <laughs> we never, uh, and the music is fantastic. Oh, yeah. Oh, you got to hear it. Yeah, the little teardown music. Is that, <laughs> yeah? When they're, they're, what, what does it go? Something like, Hi-ho, hi-ho, the Ten Commandments we go. Sing it with me, you little idiot. What are you doing? <clears throat> well, moving on today, we have got, uh, well, a little bitch Mexican girl. <laughs> yeah, we do. It, it's true. She's she's little. She's bitchy. She's in the country illegally in Texas. Yes. <laughs> And uh, she's, uh, well, I will give this to her. She has balls. <laughs> <laughs> she has balls. She's, uh, of course, uh, all the rage on social media, YouTube, Twitter, all the uh, yes. all the good stuff there. And she's uh, causing a big stink because she's calling out Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's taking it to him. Quote, shut your mouth and respect us. Yes. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, here it is. Mexicans are the ones that built your buildings. Mexicans are the ones that cut your grass. So why don't you shut your mouth and respect us? Eight-year-old Ganesha Aguirre and her mom are from Mexico. Her mom says they were victims of human trafficking, and that's how they ended up here in the U.S. Her mom is now married to a U.S. citizen and has a work visa. Despite only being eight years old, Ganesha says Trump's words were hurtful. I saw that he was doing something rude and something that I didn't really like, so I decided to stand up for Mexicans. And she did so with this video posted on YouTube. She says it was all her idea. Donald Trump, you don't deserve to be president of this country. I would tell him that it's not very nice what he's doing, and if he would stop, I would very much like him. 
And Trump is not backing down. Earlier today, he tweeted this. I love the Mexican people, but Mexico is not our friend. They're killing us at the border, and they're killing us on jobs and trade fights. <laughs> Donald Trump, you don't respect this. <laughs> you, re you gotta respect this. I'm not giving you any effing respect. You need a fucking danger. Can, can she sound more like Cartman? <laughs> <laughs> Mexicans are the ones that built your buildings. Mexicans are the ones that built your buildings. So why don't you shut your mouth and respect us? Yeah, shut your mouth and respect us. Yeah. <laughs> you respect my thoughts. Ah. Yes. <laughs> Holy shit, are you kidding me? <sighs> well. Yeah. Yes, the story does, of course, come to us from San Antonio, Texas. <laughs> uh, oh, yes, uh, as major companies cut ties with presidential candidate Donald Trump after his controversial comments about Mexican immigrants. <laughs> Well, a young San Antonio, Texas girl. Oh, wait, uh, let's be fair here. A young Mexican girl that's in the country illegally. <laughs> <laughs> yes, let's, let's be right damn fair with that, bitches. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, she's taken to YouTube to deliver a message of her own. That's right. Mexicans are the ones that built your buildings. Mexicans are the ones that cut your you know, and it goes back to when I was a kid. Yes. You know, my, my parents always taught me, you know, you, you have to give respect to get respect. Yes. I guess in Mexico, they just teach you, you got to whine like a little bitch and get the respect. <laughs> Yes, Ganesha Aguirre, eight years old, and her mother are from Mexico, of course. <laughs> and they said that, oh, this this is a great story. They were victims of human trafficking. <laughs> yes, and, that, and that's, of course, how they ended up illegally in the United States. Yeah. Yes, Ganesha's mother said she is now has a work visa and is married to a U.S. citizen. Thank you to eHarmony and President Obama. <laughs> well, Ganesha said Trump's words were hurtful when he announced his run for president about two weeks ago. Now, look at that. They, they, they not only cut our grass and trim our lawns and stuff, but they, they respond within two weeks. <laughs> And you know, Gilbert, that's yes. that's exactly why uh, Mexico and uh, nobody in Mexico are terrorists. Yes, <laughs> right. You know, it takes them two weeks to respond. Yeah. <laughs> well, Trump insinuated that Mexican immigrants were fueling crime in America. Oh, hi, MS thirteen. <laughs> Right, so let me get this straight. He says something truthful. Yes. Then he loses Macy's. Yes. <laughs> then two weeks later, he has to deal with Mexican Cotman. <laughs> well... He insinuated, of course, that those Mexican immigrants were indeed fueling crime in America like they are. <laughs> yeah, even even going further specific and saying that they're bringing in drugs. Yes. <laughs> uh -huh. They're bringing in crime and they're rapists, he said. <laughs> well, I saw what he was doing, something rude and something I didn't like. Oh, you didn't like it, just like somebody didn't like the Ten Commandments statue. <laughs> oh, I get it now. Oh, so now, now, gang, yes. all, all we have to do is not like something and we can have them shut down. <laughs> 
Are you freaking kidding me? Oh, that's why power is corrupt, and it is. We see it every day. We no, see it in every job. No, it's the same thing. No, Louie, the little Mexican girl has no power. No. <laughs> No, and, and and of course, you know, you might say, okay, well, now she's going to get the, the public support behind her, yes. and, and then she'll be powerful. Uh, I would say no. I would say they're just more idiots gravitating towards an idiot with 15 seconds of fame. <laughs> well, she says he was doing something rude and something I didn't like, so I decided to stand up for Mexicans. <laughs> Oh, I think I'm going to stand up for Mexicans, too. (laughs) Well, Ganesha said, and she did so, of course, with that video posted on YouTube that should be uh, actually cut down, uh, deleted, ripped down from there. Because, of course, in the video, the little bitch, (laughs) yes, is wearing... San Antonio uh, baseball team, or, or no, football. I don't know. I'm not a sports guy, but she's got some San Antonio sports team shirt on. That That's that's an infringement of copyright, baby. <laughs> <sighs> but, of course, will they take it down? No, because she's a little cute Mexican girl who's here illegally in Texas, and, and it's all... Yes, quote, Donald Trump, you don't deserve to be president of this country. Well, who the hell are you, foreigner, to say that? <laughs> Holy shit. Next, ne- ne- next we're going to have the Nazis uh, p- coming up from Germany going, you cannot have him as president. <laughs> He's fine. <laughs> He's fine. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, 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 you know, before the show, I, yes. I sat here and I'm like, okay, these these stories are really going to make me want to spend that fifty cents on public executions. And, <laughs> you know, I'm I'm, I'm going to go through them. I'm going to read them. Yes. I'm going to let Gilbert do his stupid shit. Yes. And <laughs> let Louis say something completely unrelated. And, and, and I'm just going to move to that, that that first commercial break is my goal. Yeah. I, 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 if, I, if I can just get there. Which which uh, woman are you married to or living with now? Yes. <laughs> <sighs> but I can't do it. I can't do it. Nope. Well, much calmer today, Ganesha said she would like Trump to do a better job of choosing his words in the future. I would tell him it's not very nice what he's doing, and if he would stop, I would very much like him, Ganesha said. When asked uh, by reporters if Donald Trump gave a shit what she thought... (laughs) He looked at the camera and said, You're fired! (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's right. You're fired. It's probably something I should get used to. Yes. (laughs) Uh That's okay. I don't give a sh... (laughs) Everything that could go wrong goes wrong. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah. All kinds of wrong. Break for a commercial. Yeah, okay. (laughs) All right. Well, I, I made it, I guess, technically to the commercial. No, I didn't. I blew it. No. <laughs> well, uh, when we come back from the commercial, Jenny's waving at me, telling me that we need to go to the live stream for President Obama, who is speaking on the Affordable Care Act. But uh, now that I've seen what President Obama is currently live speaking about, which is the Affordable Care Act, or, of course, Obamacare, I have made a judgment call for my listeners. They don't give a shit. (laughs) That's right. So when we come back, we're going to talk about uh, Greece and their no vote. And, of course, not meaning that Greece will leave Euro. It's just that they're voting no for some unknown reason. (laughs) And I don't know about you, Gilbert, but I think that is way more important than anything Obama could possibly be saying about... Obamacare. Yes. <laughs> I just, I'm just going to stick with that right there. Hang on, gang. We'll be back in two. We're New York's best talk radio, HTLA Radio 1. What if?
if there was a coffee that was sourced from some of the world's most renowned growing regions, abundant with rich, fertile soil. What if this coffee was picked at the perfect moment, then packed meticulously and shipped carefully to be roasted under the watchful eye of coffee masters? What if it was expertly blended, ground, and sealed, ensuring maximum flavor and freshness, then brewed in small batches, and always served fresh within 20 minutes, just the way you like it? Now, what if this coffee just happened to be the coffee you already know and love? Tim Hortons, always fresh, always great tasting coffee. Automatic freshness, softness, and static control has never been easier with the Bounce Dryer Bar. I just stick it to the inside of my dryer and I never have to remember. Oh, Old Spice Body Spray makes you smell like power! It's so powerful it sells itself in other people's commercials. You smell like outdoor freshness. You smell like power. Yeah, I do. <laughs> power! Ba -ba 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 power! Oh! I stood outside assessing the situation. I knew it could be rough in there, but how rough? There was no way to know for sure. Hey, guys. Yeah! But hey, a new house, it's a blank canvas, and we got a great one. Thanks to a really low mortgage rate from Navy Federal Credit Union. You could pink. So she's a princess. You got a problem with that? Hoorah! Hoorah! Four million members, four million stories. Navy Federal Credit Union. Hi, I'm Mike, founder of DollarShaveClub.com. What is DollarShaveClub.com? Well, for a dollar a month, we send high-quality razors right to your door. Yeah. A dollar. Are the blades any good? No. Our blades are f***ing great. Each razor has stainless steel blades and aloe vera lubricating strip and a pivot head. It's so gentle a toddler could use it. And do you like spending $20 a month on brand name razors? 19 go to Roger Federer. I'm good at tennis. And do you think your razor needs a vibrating handle, a flashlight, a back scratcher and 10 blades? Your handsome ass grandfather had one blade and polio. Looking good, pop up! Stop paying for shave tech you don't need. And stop forgetting to buy your blades every month. Alejandro and I are gonna ship them right to you. We're not just selling razors, we're also making new jobs. Alejandro, what were you doing last month? Not working. What are you doing now? Working. I'm no Vanderbilt, but this train makes hay. <laughs> So stop forgetting to buy your blades every month and start deciding where you're going to stack all those dollar bills I'm saving you. We are DollarShaveClub.com and the party is on. I've been so inspired by being in New York because everything from what people are wearing on the street to the way they're interacting with each other to drive through the West Village at, at night and you see a couple kissing on the street or you see someone fighting outside their apartment or you see so much humanity on a daily basis that even if you're not inspired by your own life that day, you can be inspired by someone else's life. You got them There's only one place to get more Taylor. You've got it locked to HTLA Radio 1, New York. And and now I have to bring up that that piece of trivia that everyone feels like they're telling people that they don't know. 
uh, no, you're not going to do that because I'm pissed at Mexicans. <laughs> Unless, of course, that was the piece of trivia you were going to, yes. uh, <laughs> you know, that that could have been it. Now, I remember uh, sitting next to you on a plane. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And and I was flying out to L.A. Right. to audition for some movie that I didn't get. Right. Which was fine. Of course. Uh, yeah. <laughs> because I, I remember I was reading the script and you said to me, you said, oh, what are you reading? And I said, oh, it's the, some John Travolta comedy. <laughs> <laughs> Called The Experts. Mm, and yeah. and uh, it's, uh, it's about two young hip Americans yeah, know. who get kidnapped by Russian spies right. to teach them mm -hmm. how to act like young hip Americans. <laughs> and you... Uh, being a fortune teller, said, oh, that sounds like, like a, a piece, piece of shit. shit. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, that's... Uh, uh, you, know, you know, that that was funny the, the first time you told that four months ago. Yeah. It was, uh, it was a real barn burner, that was. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but, of course, not so much any anymore at all. You they know. get f***ing crazy because all of a sudden nobody loves them. <laughs> Well, nobody loves them. Somebody loves them. Hey, whatever. We love you. Welcome back to the show. Your coffee and cigarettes Wednesday grinder. Yes, it is. HTLA Radio 1, New York's best talk, of course. And, uh, well, yeah, it's the Crash Man here with you this afternoon. Director Louis Lawless. Actor, idiot, Gilbert Gottfried. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes when we can't uh, cast midgets for something, we use him. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, well, he, you know, it's it's because you do that uh, bang up Hervé Villachez, uh, <laughs> you know, if, if you didn't do him so freaking well, I would never have thought to toss you at the park. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I just would not have uh, done that. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> well, uh, good to see you all back here again for our uh, second segment. And, of course, before we go any further, so we don't get the uh, phone calls, yeah. <laughs> uh, we do have to, of course, do the coffee and cigarettes afternoon. Oh, uh, no, traffic. I, I, was, I was thinking weather. I, <laughs> oh, I know why I was thinking weather, because we do have some weather reports this afternoon. Yeah, it's going to be fun. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> We, uh, we we do have them, but uh, we're going to go to the traffic first, of course. Brock favors up an HTLA chopper one. Uh, Brock, uh, take it away, sir. Hello, everybody out there. This is Brock favors with traffic on the ones. Chad Armstrong is out sick today. So I am filling in for my usual land reports, and uh, I'm up here at the chopper. But I got to tell you guys, I am loving the view. <laughs> oh, my God. All right. <laughs> well, we are um, uh, we are over the 10, and it's massively clogged down there like a pint of maple syrup on a cool November morning. And we do. Oh, oh God damn, we're going to die in this motherfucker. Oh, 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 my God. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. <laughs> okay, I am... Uh, I am very sorry, folks. <laughs> it's a little bit of a bumpy ride up here. We are now approaching the 405, uh, where the left lane is blocked by a mattress. So somebody is uh, going to be doing a little return to Ikea later today. You know what I'm saying? Oh, no, please. Oh, God damn. Oh, get me out this motherfucking dump machine right now. Oh, no, black people ain't meant to be in the sky. We ain't meant to be in the sky. Oh, mama, help me, mama. Oh, mama. <laughs> well, the four or five is f***ed up right now. Ain't nobody going down this I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm very sorry, folks. I'm very sorry, brother. But I'm losing my shit up here. Actually, you have every right to. We're about to crash. <laughs> Oh, 
Uh, it never, never gets old. Yes. <laughs> no. You being Catholic, you realize that you can have birth control. You realize that? Yes, Louis. But there's more important things to be considered right now, like the condolences out to Brock's family. <laughs> <laughs> he, he just, he never gets it. Yes. <laughs> Well, moving on today, of course, uh, we are not going live to bring you the president's useless words on the Affordable Care Act. <laughs> so <laughs> we, are, we are, of course, not going to do that to you. Uh, but we are going to bring you the Greek news. Uh, bend over and open up. Here it comes. Yes. <laughs> yes, the Greek prime minister says no vote doesn't mean Greece will leave Euro. What does it mean, you ask? Well, it means no. <laughs> yes, Greek Prime Minister Alexis Cyprius struck a defiant tone today, urging his fellow nationals in a televised address to vote no in a planned Sunday referendum over bailout terms demanded by international creditors. This, this kind of takes me back to, oh, I don't know, yesterday when I got my last creditor in the mail bitching for money. <laughs> uh, yes, you know the letters that start out without prejudice. Yeah. Oh, wait, no, you don't. You're not in any kind of debt. You're Jewish. <laughs> yes. Uh, it'd be nice if I could just tell the creditors, you know, uh, well, I've, I've taken a vote with the family here. And, of course, we don't like your terms of 40% interest on my bill. Yes. <laughs> so uh, we, we've uh, we've voted no. Yeah. Well, Cyprus said a no vote could mean Greece would leave the Eurozone. <laughs> Are you in the Eurozone? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, and that European leaders who suggested so were liars. He said his government was working to get a better deal for the Greek people, particularly the elderly. You know, if you're broke and bankrupt and you've got all these creditors demanding all their money, who the hell are you to say no to you want a better deal? What the hell is that? Well, U.S. and European stocks nevertheless surged today after an earlier leaked letter from Greece's government to Eurozone officials appeared uh, to show Athens is indeed ready to concede to creditor demands over new bailout terms. Yes. Uh, okay, where's where's my bailout? Um, <laughs> Really? Because I, cause really, I, I, I want a, I want a better deal, and I, I want a bailout. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, it's not clear, however, if the concessions would be significant enough to bring the two sides at loggerheads for months together for a last-minute deal. And German Chancellor Angela Merkel also appeared to rule out any agreement on a new aid program for Greece before Sunday's referendum. Cyprius's comments today add further confusion to a negotiation process that has bounced back and forth with alleged proposals and counter proposals, and that's what I got to do. I got to I got to wait them out. I got to give them proposals and counter proposals. And... Okay. Well, the letter first obtained by the Financial Times came as Eurozone finance ministers held a conference call uh, today in Brussels to discuss the last-minute bailout proposals for Athens. That ended with Eurozone finance ministers saying that they would wait until after Greece's vote before holding more talks. Well, the Eurogroup united in decision to wait for the outcome of the Greece referendum before any further talks. Petir Kizmir, Slovakia's finance minister, wrote on Twitter, quote, Let's not put the cart before the horse, he added. Is he drinking? <laughs> 
Well, stock markets volatile all week. Rose is the Dow Jones Industrial Average was up uh, 0.5%. The Standard and Poor's 500 Index gained 0.4%. The NASDAQ Composite, Composite Index added another 0.2%. European markets jumped even higher. Germany's DAX Index closed it up 2%. And the CAC 40 in Paris advanced 1.9%. Britain's FTSE 100 index added 1.4%. Screw it. Let's just have Greece go into ruins. It's doing great for the rest of the planet. <laughs> well, as you will note, our amendments are concrete and they fully respect the robustness and credibility of the design of the overall program, Cyprus wrote in a letter sent to Brussels late Tuesday. One of the demands Athens is refusing to back down on is changing a 30% tax discount for Greece's remote islands, the letter shows. Now, the emergency conference call in Brussels comes after Eurozone officials rejected a, a Tuesday appeal from Athens to extend us $270 billion. <laughs> In an international aid package that has been popping up or propping up rather Greece's economy since the financial crisis. When Greece failed to repay 1.8 billion to the International Monetary Fund on Tuesday night, it joined the ranks of Zimbabwe, Haiti, Sudan, Somalia and Afghanistan under the Taliban as nations that have reneged on IMF loans. Uh, I'd have to ask who the hell's in charge of that mess. <laughs> You know, what, what, I don't get it. You know, Greece is one of the most beautiful places on the planet. Yes. Their tourism is second to none. Yes. They, they have nothing but tourism bucks. Yes. <laughs> uh, you get, you got to ask, where the hell is it all going? Where Where is it going? Where is it going? How many different families do you have? <laughs> Thank you, Louis. Back to you, Bill. Well, it also became the first developed world country to miss a repayment to the IMF. No new financial lifeline for Greece was immediately forthcoming, and indeed, why the hell would it? <laughs> we, we should pay the little Mexican girl $1.8 billion. Yeah. <laughs> well, in Athens, some Greeks took Cyprus's comments in stride. Cyprus had no other choice. We can at least accept that he has tried his best. Greece is such a small country with very little power in the European Union, says Agleki Larutu, 58, a pharmacist. Of course, the government made mistakes, but the lenders are outright blackmailing and squashing us. <laughs> blackmailing you because they want to get paid back? Yes. <laughs> wow. Talk about uh, Crash Daddy just writing off an entire country now. Thank you. Well, no, I, I guess I won't write them off. I'll just put them in the Mexican folder. <laughs> <laughs> well, other Greeks were less forgiving, of course. This is ridiculous. Cyprus has to resign now. He's handing this poor country off on a card game, says Loana Popadakoulos, 37, referring to Sunday's vote. Well, Sunday's national referendum will be on the austerity measures demanded by Greece's international creditors, the IMF, European Central Bank, and the European Commission, in return for a new aid package. Greece's ruling uh, Syriza party under Cyprus, who came into office in January, says that the vote is necessary to strengthen his government's negotiating position. European leaders counter that the vote is effectively a judgment on whether Greece wants to stay in the Eurozone, a 19-nation economic and currency collective. An opinion poll published today in the... I don't even know what kind of name that newspaper is... <laughs> I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce that sucker. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, the new, the, we'll just call it the Greek newspaper. <laughs> yeah. Yes, the Greek newspaper showed that most Greeks are likely to vote no to the terms proposed by the creditors, but the no's side lead appeared to be narrowing. In separate developments in Greece today, the country's finance ministry ordered around 1,000 banks to reopen so that 
retirees who don't have bank cards would be able to cash pension checks. Banks across Greece have been closed since last Monday, and cash withdrawal limits for residents at ATMs is about $68 a day. Well, the European Central Bank also met today in Frankfurt to discuss whether it should alter the terms under which it had been providing emergency finances to Greece's banks. Without that support, Greek lenders would find it increasingly difficult to meet their short-term liquidity needs, a scenario that could dramatically up the stakes for Athens as it tries to avert financial collapse ahead of Sunday's vote. There was no immediate word on the outcome of those discussions as of yet. So so there they are, and... Uh, yes. I don't know. I, I think uh, just like you know they do with me. I think it's time for the uh, the, the the creditors to to go into Greece and uh, take over all the, the the companies making ass loads of money in tourism. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I, I think they should uh, chop up that country, uh, take ownership of it, give it like twenty or thirty percent to Germany, yes. and twenty or thirty to I don't know Italy. Throw them in there. Yes. <laughs> You know what? We'll, we'll just do this. Split it all up. Uh, screw Greece. We don't need the country anyway. Bye bye. <laughs> That's all. That's what we gotta do. Bullshitters. Yeah. Never keep your mouth shut. Always uh-huh. hustle. Always looking for something to do and, and uh-huh. putting things together. That's, right. that's a f- American. Look how they took the country away from England. <laughs> yes, and, and and Louis is is sort of kind of on a point. Uh, you know, he he's of course talking about England again. Yes, and of course England would be one of the countries in that that Euro group there. <laughs> yeah. <you know. laughs> so, uh, grads, Louis, uh, way to go on keeping on point. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, moving on today to something, uh, I don't know, is it less abrasive, more abrasive? Well, at least it's nobody bitching, and whining, and moaning. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe actually it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it could be, never mind, don't listen to me. <laughs> well, the attacks, of course, recently underscore ISIS's reach... A year, a year after declaring a caliphate against the United States and attacking everywhere but. <laughs> That's right. In Tunis today, a series of deadly terror attacks in the past week across Europe, Africa, and the Middle East underscore the Islamic State's increasing ability to spread fear, change societies, and impact economies since declaring caliphate a year ago. Impact economies. The last story, isn't all the markets up? <laughs> Yeah, so th- I guess that is a true gauge of the sand spider's control of our economy. <laughs> well, authorities from Australia, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. Really? Australia, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. Wow, yeah, those, yeah, sure they'd be. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, they've looked on with increasing alarm at the militant's reach since the group seized more than a third of Syria and Iraq last summer. The Islamic State may not have been directly involved in all of last week's attacks in Tunisia, Kuwait, and France that killed more than 65 people, but it did claim responsibility of two of the events and and at a minimum is likely to have inspired a third. And if that roof idiot wasn't such a retard... (laughs) Yes, and just uh, launch the attack on the following uh, d- uh, week there, like, yes. he thought, <laughs> like he was supposed to. We could have illustrated our point more. <laughs> yes. Well, they're sending a message, says Rafa Tabib, a Tunisia security analyst at the University of Tours in France. They are sending a message to the Kuwaiti government that they can reproduce these conflicts on their soil to the French government that the Islamic State can mobilize Arab people to live in, or who live, I should say, in France. And they are attacking tourism, which is a major sector in Tunisia's economy. If I was the ISIS PR guy, (laughs) right? You know, I'd be like, well, you know, we're not really making any strides anywhere. Oh, look, Greece sucks and all the uh, other economies of the planet are doing really well. Let's claim responsibility for Greece. (laughs) Oh, no, wait, that wouldn't work either because that's doing everybody else good. Yes. (laughs) So, yeah, never mind. I'll shut up and keep going. 
<laughs> well, the Islamic State called for an uptick in violence during Islam's holy month of Ramadan, which began in mid-June and runs through mid-July. Well, look at that. It's a, it's a month. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> The attacks on the three continents last week not only fulfilled that promise, but sent a message the situation is only going to escalate. At least 53 soldiers died Wednesday in the Sinai in attacks on Egyptian security sites by militants. The incident followed the assassination of Egypt's top prosecutor, as well as killing three at a police station in Cairo earlier this week. Officials suspect... Islamic State linked militants in the attacks, but no group has yet taken responsibility for that. Last week, the Islamic State took credit for the suicide bombing at a Shiite mosque in Kuwait that killed 27 people and a gunman opening fire on tourists at a Tunisian resort killing 38. On Wednesday, prosecutors announced the suspect in the French attack on a gas factory that included the beheading of his former boss, is believed to have ties to Islamic State extremist as well. Paris Chief Prosecutor Francois Molins told reporters that Yassin Salahi's motive may have been personal, but he was also furthering the group's goals through his actions. That's becoming more and more common in extremist attacks. The identification to the Islamic State doesn't necessarily mean a direct connection to commanders in Iraq or Syria or, or even clear understanding of its message, says Benoit Gomez a terrorism expert at the Chatham House, a think tank in London. Perhaps more than anything, it's just mere fascination with the brand. <laughs> yes, because that logo is so hot. <laughs> yeah, just ask Walmart. <laughs> Well, across the globe, nations are tightening security. Places such as Egypt, or in particular Tunisia, which has the most nationals fighting under the Islamic State banner, are going a step further by cracking down on homegrown militants, including shuttering unsanctioned mosques and cutting off funding to non-governmental groups that may have ties to extremism. The attacks are part of the backlash from such crackdowns. In Tunisia, for example, Islamic State militants used to operate in the mountains, to be said, the mountains are now more controlled than ever before. Most of them have been forced to leave the mountains. They're now terrorizing us in the cities. <laughs> now, closing down mosques may be a base for extremist activity, but it also poses problems, he said. The crackdown decision is good, but it's also too late because these mosques play a major role in the working class areas, poor neighborhoods, to be said. And they're helping the poor people with charity, helping unemployed youth by giving them funds to start small businesses. Wow! <laughs> Wish there was a church in the USA that would give me funds to start small businesses. Holy <laughs> crap, really? <laughs> I don't know. We might have to convert to Islam. Yes. <laughs> That's right. Uh, starting small businesses, of course, they've gained the sympathy of a large base of people. In France, there's concern about raising social turmoil after the last attack. Xenophobia against Arabs, North Africans, and Muslims was already on the rise after a January attack at the offices of the French satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo. <laughs> Holy crap. You know, how many times are we going to talk about the stupid magazine in France? Yes. <laughs> Who care? Come on. In Texas, they do better renderings of Mohammed. <laughs> you know? Well, in some ways, the militants have already accomplished their goal of spreading fear through the disruption of businesses and impact on local economies. Tunisia was finally stabilizing after its 2011 revolution with a new secular government and tourism almost 15 percent of the gross domestic product that year. And it was reviving. That's likely all to change now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, in every Tunisian family, there are people that earn a living from tourism, even the families of the terrorists, says Basim al-Basahin, a trainee barber working in Tunis. These attacks will only do harm to the Tunisian economy, and I fear that we will never see tourists again. <laughs> well... If you, um, he's a barber, so yes. you know he he says the actual word tourists. Yes. Yeah. You know. uh, if the majority of the countries can, you know, refrain from calling us infidels, <laughs> uh, you know, you, you might actually see a little bit of, uh, you know, terrorism or, or tourism. Sorry, return. Yeah. <laughs> 
Oh, our terrorism uh, is, is down this year. <laughs> uh, I wanted to go to Erie or Tunisia for summer vacation, uh, but it's becoming difficult to find where to go for holidays nowadays. Really, there's nowhere that we can really go uh, safely. It can blow up anywhere. And that, of course, was from uh, Laurie Dessange, 38, an accountant in Paris, who says she won't be visiting Tunisia anytime soon. Well, you know, thanks, Lori. Uh, we really appreciate that comment that you won't go on a vacation soon. Thanks. Yeah, that's, uh, that's really I think great. it should be short and sweet. Lori's holiday? Yeah. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll, we'll let her know. We'll make sure uh, that uh, you said she's only allowed to go on holiday for like, I don't know, two hours. <laughs> Well, moving along today, of course, uh, it's time for that uh, commercial break again. Break for a commercial. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> yes, I, I'm aware of that. It's a, I just actually said it's time for a yes. commercial again. <laughs> you're, you're just retarded, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do have to go to that commercial uh, again, of course, because... Uh, our Lord and Savior Gilbert Gottfried is spoken. <laughs> uh, but don't worry, when we come back, uh, all kinds of more rage coming from me. Yes. Uh, <laughs> as the New York City Pride March takes on new life after marriage equality ruling. Yes, now it's all about straight sex rights. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. I just... Just gonna gonna leave that there. If it goes wrong, it's yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, stick around. We'll be back in two with the uh, New York City Gay Pride March. Now um, you know defending the rights of the straight people. <laughs> <laughs> can can we uh, when we when we come back? Let's let's just mute him. Yes. <laughs> Uh, no, not not you, of course, Gilbert. Of, of course, I'm talking about Louis. He's he's talking too damn much. We'll be back in two. You've got it locked to HLA Radio One, New York. Good morning. Welcome to Tim Hortons Cafe and Bake Shop, where fresh always tastes better. What can I make you this morning? How about our new flatbread breakfast paninis? Made fresh, just for you, with your favorite breakfast ingredients on maple or multigrain flatbread, then grilled to hot, melted perfection. Just $2.99. Who couldn't warm up to that? Tim Horton's Cafe and Bake Shop, where quality really does meet value. I've been so inspired by being in New York because everything from what people are wearing on the street to the way they're interacting with each other to drive through the West Village at, at night and you see a couple kissing on the street or you see someone fighting outside their apartment or you see so much humanity on a daily basis that even if you're not inspired by your own life that day, you can be inspired by someone else's life. You got them There's only one place to get more Taylor. Hi, I'm Mike, founder of DollarShaveClub.com. What is DollarShaveClub.com? Well, for a dollar a month, we send high-quality razors right to your door. Yeah, a dollar. Are the blades any good? No. Our blades are f***ing great. Each razor has stainless steel blades and aloe vera lubricating strip and a pivot head. It's so gentle a toddler could use it. And do you like spending $20 a month on brand name razors? 19 go to Roger Federer. I'm good at tennis. And do you think your razor needs a vibrating handle, a flashlight, a back scratcher, and 10 blades? Your handsome ass grandfather had one blade and polio. Looking good, pop up! 
Stop paying for shave tech you don't need. And stop forgetting to buy your blades every month. Alejandro and I are going to ship them right to you. We're not just selling razors, we're also making new jobs. Alejandro, what were you doing last month? Not working. What are you doing now? Working. I'm no Vanderbilt, but this train makes hay. So stop forgetting to buy your blades every month and start deciding where you're going to stack all those dollar bills I'm saving you. We are DollarShaveClub.com, and the party is on. I stood outside assessing the situation. I knew it could be rough in there, but how rough, there was no way to know for sure. Hey, guys. Daddy, it's pink! But hey, a new house, it's a blank <laughs> canvas, and we got a great one, thanks to a really low mortgage rate from Navy Federal Credit Union. You could pink. So she's a princess. You got a problem with that? Hoorah! Hoorah! Four million members, four million stories. Navy Federal Credit Union. Automatic freshness, softness, and static control has never been easier with the Bounce Dryer Bar. I just stick it to the inside of my dryer, and I never have to remember. Oh, Old Spice Body Spray makes you smell like power! It's so powerful, it sells itself in other people's commercials! You smell like outdoor freshness. You smell like power? Yeah, I do! <laughs> power! Ba -ba 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 power! New York's best talk radio, ATLA Radio 1. Hi, I am Melvin Leroy with the, the camera and the thing and the, the potion with the fire. And I'm Melvin, Melvin Leroy. I, you want to stand in front of the and I'll go action. <laughs> <laughs> You, you know, I uh, I said to uh, mute him when we got back, Jenny. <laughs> the music is fantastic. Oh yeah. Oh, you gotta hear it. Well, it's uh, you know good to good to Christ. I need a new job. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's what we should do. We we we, we should I, I don't know re re remote the the show yes. or something. I, I should uh, I should get Jenny in the booth and yes. and get Louie on the phone and get you on the phone yes. and 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 then just leave. <laughs> <laughs> that was a mistake on my part. Oh, okay. Well, then just Jenny and Gilbert then. Okay. okay. <laughs> Whatever. Well, listen, you are back with HTLA Radio 1, New York's best talk, of course. And uh, as much as today's coffee and cigarettes, the uh, Wednesday grinder sucks, hey, at least it's not Joe Rogan and his hippies. That's right. That's a little, uh, little you radio humor there. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back to the big show, of course, your coffee and cigarettes, the Wednesday Grinder, as a promised. And uh, we've had all kinds of stuff today, of course. Yes. We've had the uh, Donald Trump-Mexican standoff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where the hell is she again? She's Mexicans are the ones that built your buildings. <laughs> Mexicans are the ones that cut your grass. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you shut your mouth and respect us? You're picking me these two Mexican things. <laughs> Yes, that stinking little Mexican girl was brought to you by the fine folks at Tim Hortons. Yes. <laughs> oh, and they're not going to be around anymore. <laughs> yeah, we, I've managed to successfully blow that sponsor. Yes. Yeah. They're, they're going to drop me. But it, it's okay because I, I've got a good two weeks before the Mexican girl comes after me. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Welcome back to the show. And of course, uh, now we have to get to, of course, a story that that I've I've just been stroking my penis all afternoon to get to this one. <laughs> yes, I have, and now it's finally here. Jenny, pass me the bottle of oil. <laughs> <laughs> Sex is 
is only the tip of the iceberg. Well, whatever. Just screw you. It's my five knuckle chuckle. <laughs> That's right, and of course that term, uh, the uh, yes. the five knuckle chuckle. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, little known fact, but that uh, that actually is a term from Texas. <laughs> it uh, it is actually. Which which uh, woman are you married to or living with now? And for Christ's sake, can I just get to the story, please? <laughs> You know, you know, Louis. We'll we'll have conversations later. Yes. I'll you know we'll I'll, I'll call you up after the show, and we can talk about all that innocuous crap. But but you know we're we're live on the air, you idiot. <laughs> yeah. All right, deep breath, deep breath, meditation. Oh. <laughs> Well, moving on today, of course, we do have to, unfortunately, bring you the coverage of the New York City Pride Pride Parade March thing. Yes. <laughs> yes, and it's taking on new life, of course, after marriage equality. Yes, two days after the Supreme Court legalized gay marriage across this fine country. Millions of people in rainbow-striped shirts, headbands, flower necklaces, tutus, capes, wigs, F off... <laughs> Oh, yes, and even the fake eyelashes. Yes. <laughs> I, I guess that's to celebrate Caitlin. <laughs> well, yes, they lined Fifth Avenue on uh, June 28th there for the New York City Pride March. And the parade is part of an annual series of events commemorati commemorating the Stonewall Riots, a three-day protest against police harassment of gay patrons at the Stonewall Inn, and... A watershed moment in the LGBT movement. The parade featured several new chants this year, namely All 50 States and Love One. <laughs> oh, and of course, yeah, we've got some quotes I have to do. <laughs> well, I, I feel like everyone from all walks of life has to come out this year. <laughs> Says New York resident Tom Skelton, yeah. <laughs> who was, of course, attending his fourth NYC Pride March. It's been kind of a social explosion, so to speak. <laughs> well, couples, performers, and drag queens. I'm not sure what the hell part they play. Yes. <laughs> uh, but they trekked, drove, roller skated, and in some cases... Segwayed the two mile route. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all the way from 36th Street and 5th Avenue, past the historic Stonewall Inn to Greenwich Street and Christopher Street. And no, it's not goddamn named after me. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, that gay hugging mother effer. <laughs> yes, still in the closet, New York Mayor Bill de Blasio. Yes. <laughs> Well, he slapped high fives with spectators while a Netflix float, which featured several cast members of Orange is the New Black and gay British actors Ian McKellen and Derek Jacoby waved to the crowd from the sunroofs of Fiat 500s. Yes, that's the official car of Gandalf. <laughs> Well, even those homo representatives of the Boy Scouts of America were there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, all those happy Boy Scout leaders who can now diddle openly their young boys. <laughs> yes, they were there with big smiles on, waving the flags of all 50 states, marching near the front of the parade, followed by later floats representing the Stonewall Inn and corporations like Coca-Cola, Citibank, and Hilton Hotels and Resorts, whose wedding a cake shaped float drew cheers when two grooms standing on the top layer leaned into a long uh, kiss. Uh, uh. They get fing crazy because all of a sudden nobody loves them. Yeah, come here, Louie. Uh.
Now, Andrew Coda, a Fordham Law School student, says the previous parades only comprised a day-long celebration, but this year's is punctuated by a weekend-long celebration in which we're taking over Central Park. <laughs> Uh, Gilbert, you remember uh, all those times you talk about my my movie show in Chicago? Yes. Yeah. I remember uh yeah. being on your radio show in Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I I think uh tomorrow, uh yeah, that's exactly where I'm going to be broadcasting from. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've had it with this city I'm leaving. Yes. <laughs> I think it's really amazing. <laughs> I know a bunch of people who came from here and out of state, out of country even, Coda says. <laughs> well, New York resident Anisha Alprasad, <laughs> yes, of course, who is attending her third New York City Pride March, says the mood even felt a bit different from previous years. Everyone is just really, really happy, she says. You can tell from their ear-to-ear -ear smiles. Well, Breno Pinto, a visiting student from St. John's University, uh, and from the what? Wow. Okay, he's, he's from a university in Brazil. <laughs> Universidad Federal de Minas. <laughs> <laughs> well, in his home country of Brazil, pointed out a less cheerful spectacle. Uh, a few anti-gay rights protesters bearing signs that read, Repent, Receive Jesus Mercy, and similar slogans, still such counter-demonstrations, he says. Well, they're even more frequent back in Brazil. <laughs> yes, here it's a lot more calm, Breno says. There's more respect here. Really? Guess you didn't see the Mexican girl video. <laughs> Well, few appeared to notice the anti-gay demonstrators lingering, lingering behind the crowds of spectators. Sorry, I'll wear a bright pink shirt next time. <laughs> yes, and uh, yes, they erupted with cheers as each new group of marchers approached. Why would the protesters cheer when new marchers approached? Why? why? <laughs> I, I nearly got kicked out of a theater. I, went, I can't remember what I saw about two weeks ago because I was booing and screaming. Uh, okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. So, so that's the uh, that's the official uh, coverage there. HTLA covering the the gay pride parade that was, of course, what three days ago, and we missed it. Yeah. <laughs> but that's okay. I mean, that was that was partially my fault. Yes. You know. <laughs> Um, they, no, they they actually asked me. Oh, okay, Crash. Well, uh, this morning the uh, gay pride parade's going on. Uh, can you take uh, Jenny and, and a crew down there and and uh, you know do some interviews and stuff? And I said no. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, I'd like to have that as my slogan in, in life. <laughs> oh yeah, Gilbert, no Godfrey. Yeah. <laughs> well, moving on. <clears throat> To something, I guess, more innocuous, benign. Yes. Something that, uh, something that I can actually get through without thinking or worrying about repercussions. Or, <laughs> you know. That, of course, would be today's Obama news. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and yes, yes, I have been informed he is still, still, right now, uh, what, 40, 50 minutes later, yes. uh, he is still speaking live on his Affordable Care Act. <laughs> but that's not what I'm bringing you now. <laughs> no, not going to do it. No, because uh, this story here actually, well, it makes a little more sense and it might actually affect some people. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, uh, of course, Obama in Cuba announced today embassy openings, that's right, in Washington, while reopened embassies will restore diplomatic ties between the United States and Cuba. Full normalization requires more actions, including an end to the trade embargo that must be approved by the Republican-run Congress. In announcing that embassies will reopen this month, Obama again called on Congress Wednesday to lift the embargo and cast his opening to Cuba as a choice between the past and the future. 
Quote, yes, there are those who want to turn back the clock and double down on a policy of isolation, Obama said, but it's long past time for us to realize that this approach isn't working. It hasn't worked for 50 years. Republican congressional leaders, meanwhile, said the embassy decision is another example of how Obama gives the Castro regime things without demanding any kind of democratic reforms in return. Yeah. <laughs> The Obama administration is handing the Castros a lifetime dream uh, of legacy without getting a thing for the Cuban people being oppressed by his brutal communist dictatorship, the House Speaker John Boner said. Both Obama and Cuban Cuban counterpart Raul Castro made simultaneous announcements about the embassy reopenings. Cuban state-run television took the unusual step of televising Obama's remarks from the White House. This is a historic step towards our efforts to normalize relations with the Cuban government and people and begin a new chapter with our neighbors in the Americas, Obama said from the Rose Garden today. A statement from Cuba's foreign ministry confirms the decision to restore diplomatic relations between two countries and open permanent diplomatic missions in their respective capitals from July 20th. Obama said Secretary of State John Kerry... (laughs) Well, of course, travel to Havana to formally reopen the U.S. Embassy. It will be the first Cuban trip for an American Secretary of State since 1945. The embassy will enable more Americans' to contact with the pa- cu- Cuban people, of course, not the Papua New Guinea people, <laughs> including traditional educational and cultural exchanges. Obama said, adding that I strongly believe that the best way for America to support our values is through engagement. Well, yeah, because that worked in the Middle East. <laughs> <laughs> Embassy operations will also promote cooperation on items like counterterrorism, disaster response, and regional development, he said. The United States and Cuba have operated interest sections in each other's country since the late 1970s, but those operations do not enjoy the status of embassies. On Wednesday, the United States' top diplomat in Cuba, U.S. Interest Sanction Chief Jeffrey De Laurentiis, delivered a letter from the White House to the Cuban government about the renewed embassies. While the reestablishment of embassies restores diplomatic ties broken 54 years ago, full normalization of the American-Cuban relations depends on other issues that have yet to be resolved. They include the compensation for U.S. property confiscated by Fidel Castro's government after his revolution, returning U.S. fugitives who have found safe harbor in Cuba, and the status of political prisoners in Cuba, plus the trade embargo. The embargo shuts America out of Cuba's future, and it only makes life worse for the Cuban people, Obama said in his plea to Congress. The United States broke diplomatic relations with Cuba back in 1961, not long after Castro took power. The ensuing Cold War between the U.S. and the island 90 miles south of Florida ranged from the imposition of the trade embargo against Cuba to U.S. attempts to assassinate Castro. In October of 1962, the Soviet Union's attempt to use Cuba as a staging area for missiles that could reach the United States nearly triggered a nuclear war. The embassy uh, announcements came shortly after the United States removed Cuba from the list of state sponsors of terrorism, a move that resulted from Obama's December announcement of a new relationship with Cuba. A year ago, it might have seemed impossible that the United States would once again be raising our flag, the Stars and Stripes, over an embassy in Havana, Obama said. This is what change looks like. Isn't that what he said last week about the gay marriage thing? (laughs) This is what change looks like. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, well, this is what America stringing up a bony little black president looks like. Well, Republicans of Cuban descent have been critical of Obama's efforts. They said Obama should be demanding more from Cuba, the release of political prisoners, more steps towards democracy in exchange for diplomatic concessions from the U.S. U.S. Representative Elena Ross Lenton, Republican of Florida, said that the Castro regime now feels emboldened to continue its attacks against the Cuban people and that Obama has turned his back on them. Opening the American embassy in Cuba will do nothing to help the Cuban people and is just another trivial attempt for President Obama to go legacy shopping. (laughs) (sighs) Yes, Republican presidential candidates have also criticized Obama's new Cuba policy, including Floridians Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio, 
Rubio, a U.S. senator, said that, quote, I intend to oppose the confirmation of an ambassador to Cuba until the compensation, fugitive, and political prisoner issues are addressed. Bush, a Miami-area resident and former governor of Florida, said that reopening of the embassies will legitimize repression in Cuba, not promote the cause of freedom and democracy. When asked if he agreed with it, he said he did. (laughs) There you go. So clearly he doesn't know. Well, he's kind of like Louie. Yeah. Well, moving on today, the former UC Berkeley students are suing the university for mishandling sexual assaults. How do you mishandle a sexual assault? <laughs> well, I guess if you grab her from the, the rear. No. Yes. <laughs> How do you? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> what the hell is that? Well, the attorneys announced today at a press conference in Emeryville, California, that three women filed a lawsuit against the University of California, Berkeley, for mishandling of their prospective sexual assault cases. Uh, Yes, USA Today College typically does not identify sexual assault victims by name, but the former Berkeley students, Sophia Karasek, Arielle Butler, and Nicoletta Cummins, publicly identified themselves at the news conference today. Their lawsuit, which is for gender discrimination. (laughs) Gender discrimination, negligence, and fraud. Yes. That's sexual assault now? (laughs) Well, it marks the first time UC Berkeley has faced legal action regarding its policies, according to the BuzzFeed report. Karasek said she was assaulted at UC Berkeley event in 2012. Karasek, now 22, claims in the lawsuit that she awoke at 3 a.m. to a man touching her after attending the California Democratic Party convention for the Cal Berkeley Democrats. Touching her where? Give us details. (laughs) In the lawsuit, Karasek said the steps for officially filing a complaint at the university title IX office against her assailant were never clearly communicated to her. As a result, she said she was unable to properly file a complaint until several months after her alleged attack. I'm frustrated, I'm angry, I'm sad, I'm disappointed, Karasek said at the press conference. Well, you know what, Karasek, so am I. And, uh, you know, this gay marriage thing, it's it's got (laughs) a... Back in September of 2013, after almost a year of uh, contacting the Center for Student Conduct for information on the action taken against her, alleged assailant, Karasek said the Title IX office told her that he had been placed on disciplinary probation for touching her. (laughs) At no time was I included in an investigatory process, nor was I given the opportunity to tell my side of the story at the hearing, Karasek said, which is, I guess, why we don't have the details about where he touched her. (laughs) Well, Berkeley will tell you it's doing better now. It's not, she said. Soon after her alleged assault, Karasek co-founded End Rape on Campus. <laughs> yes, of course, that's an organization that provides support to the resources for sexual assault victims. Uh, and then there's the group I started, which is Rape on Campus. <laughs> Yes, it's an organization that believes the dirty little drunk girls deserved it. (laughs) Well, Butler, the second plaintiff in the case, said that the lawsuit she was also assaulted back in 2012 while working under a UC Berkeley contract in Alaska as an assistant to a Ph.D. candidate. The now 21-year-old said a guest lecturer groped and touched her inappropriately on three separate occasions. Butler said she later reported the incident to UC Berkeley's Title IX department. But during a meeting with the Title IX coordinator, Butler said that she was admonished for not rebuffing her assailant's alleged advances. Yeah, right, because, you know, when you grab her boobies or her, you know, no-no place, uh, you know, she goes, oh, yeah. (laughs) I'd be like him. I'd, I'd do it again. Yeah. Well, 
Well, the Title IX coordinator then asked how her assailant was supposed to know his contact contact was not welcomed if Butler never affirmatively denied consent, the lawsuit reads. According to Butler, who previously worked with End Rape on campus, no disciplinary action has been taken against her alleged assailant. As Commons, the third plaintiff said she invited a male student whom she knew from Taekwondo into her apartment in early 2012, where he then allegedly sexually assaulted her. Cummins said she reported the assault to Tang Student Health Center at Berkeley the next day, which, according to the lawsuit, completed a hasty examination. Ooh, let's check this out. <laughs> well, Cummins said she reported the assault to the Berkeley Police Department and had a rape kit performed at the Highland Hospital in Oakland, where she said evidence of trauma was revealed. <laughs> or a good dinkin'. <laughs> Well, Cummins said the Office of Student Conduct asked her if she would pursue an investigation. Although she said she was interested, she said she was never contacted again. According to the lawsuit, her assailant has been suspended for the past year and a half and plans to return to campus this fall. Well, in the weeks and months following the lawsuit, I was in full anger, doubt, confusion, and shame, Cummins said at the press conference. Someone who is convicted of this type of crime should not be allowed to return to school. Uh, he hasn't been convicted. <laughs> The California State Auditor conducted a thorough review of UC Berkeley's handlings of sexual assault and harassment cases in 2013-14. The university told the Daily Bruin in an email statement Monday, the auditor's report, which included a review of the confidential case records, found that the case outcomes were reasonable and that sanctions were appropriate given severity of the incidents. Ha ha. <laughs> According to the statement, the university has not received a formal complaint nor seen a filing of the woman's suit. Until then, UC Berkeley spokeswoman Janet Gilmore said officials would reserve comment. And according to BuzzFeed, the Zalkin Law Firm, which filed the three women's suit, confirmed it has been filed. At UC Berkeley, we are committed to creating a campus community where sexual assault is not tolerated, but turned more into a game. <laughs> Yes, we believe under the guise of a game, women will be more accepting of the dick. <laughs> <laughs> now, working with students, faculty, and staff, we have made great strides on this front and are dedicated to building on those efforts. Joy, joy, touchy sex. <laughs> Listen to the ones that built your buildings. Oh, shut up! <laughs> You suspect this, bitch. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> well, no, that wasn't the end. I, I do have more. All right. now, according to the lawsuit, the audit found that the universities do not ensure that all faculty and staff are sufficiently trained on responding to sexual assault cases. Well, what, what, what do you got to know? Seriously. Yeah. What, 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 uh, oh, he touched you? Well, let's go investigate this. And, and if he did, kill him. And if he didn't, uh, well, have fun. <laughs> Apparently, the universities, according to the audit, need to do more to educate students on sexual violence as well as inform the and update the students who have filed sexual assault complaints on the status of their respective cases. Hey, your case is still being investigated. Next year. Well, your case is still being investigated. Next year. Well, yes. your case is still being investigated. <laughs> and when you finally retire, well, your case is still being investigated. <laughs> Well, the university should do more, of course, to demonstrate to students who may have experienced sexual harassment or sexual violence and are informed of their reporting options and what to re uh, What is all this? What, what, do, do, do kids graduate high school yes. and magically go into university and all of a sudden don't know how to call the police? <laughs> now, seriously, if you're getting sexually assaulted in a university in this country, yes. why the hell aren't you calling 911? <laughs> Seriously, you, you, these women are dicking around at the office that hands out student IDs. <laughs> you know how to spell my last name on the check, right? It's Louis Lawless. I'm glad you care. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and uh, you know, there, there is more to the story, but yes. I'm not going to read it because these women deserve everything they get. <laughs> 
Well, and finally today, our, our final story on the big show today. Yes. Of course, uh, you know I've I've I know I've gone for what an hour and a half now, and yes. uh, I, I really haven't given anybody any any good happy stories. Yes. <laughs> But uh, but now, of course, I'm I'm finishing up the whole slam dam here with one one hell of a fun story. I <laughs> am no, you'll like this, Gilbert. It's yes. uh, it's actually the story of the birth of Robin Hood. Yes, <laughs> that's right. A woman rescued after giving birth in a forest. <laughs> In Oroville, California, authorities rescued a woman and her newborn baby after her family says she gave birth in a remote national forest in Northern California. U.S. Forest Service spokesman Chris French said today that the helicopter pilot responding to a bushfire uh, spotted the mother and the infant. Rescue workers on the ground whisked the pair to safety and they were taken to a hospital, French said. French said the cause of the fire is under investigation. I cannot confirm the day of birth beyond what she reported to us that she's been there for three days, French said. Also, her statement to us was that she gave birth in her vehicle within the forest. Uh, we did not witness the birth, he says. Amber uh, Hood, 35, was released from hospital uh, today. Her, her mother said the infant uh, Robin. Yeah, there you go, Robin Hood. <laughs> Robin remains at the University of California Davis Medical Center. The medical center didn't return our call inquiring about the infant's condition. And uh, Diana Williams said the baby is doing great, whoever the hell Diana Williams is. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Williams said that the infant weighs about four pounds. Williams said that uh, Hood underwent gastric bypass surgery before the birth, a procedure that sometimes results in the birth of underweight Little Hoods. <laughs> well, according to Hood's mother, her daughter was nine months pregnant and decided to visit an Oroville casino Wednesday and walk around in an attempt to induce labor. Guess that worked. Yeah. <laughs> well, somewhere, somehow, she, yes. uh, you know, left the casino area and ended up in a remote road in the National Forest and, of course, promptly ran out of gas. <laughs> well, there was no mobile phone reception, Williams said. Oroville is about 80 miles south of Sacramento. Williams said her daughter told her that she went into labor early Thursday morning. What, like last week? <laughs> Apparently unrolled a sleeping bag and gave birth in her car's back seat. Williams said that Hood spent the next two days uh, swatting away bees and insects, fearful of bear attacks. As mother and daughter survived on uh, water and apples, Williams said. Yeah. On Saturday, Williams said that Hood used a lighter and a can of hairspray and a can of oil to start a signal fire with the sleeping bag. <laughs> Yeah, she is smart and tough, Williams said. I'm relieved it turned out all right. Yes, French of the Forest Service said that the fire burned about a quarter of an acre before it was extinguished, so it's not really that big of a deal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Well, there you go. That is your coffee and cigarettes today at the Wednesday Grinder. Hope it's helped your uh, hump day get a little easier or something. Uh, that was a mistake on my part. Right, well, just don't call in tomorrow, jerk. <laughs> uh, thank you again, Gilbert, for being here. I love to have you. Thank you for listening and support the show for the love of God. Right, <laughs> right. Uh, and, and as always, thank everybody out there in listener land for tuning in today. Uh, we muchly appreciate it. Uh, and now we're on that universal radio thing. Yes. Yeah, so... More people will soon come to hate us. <laughs> yeah. Mexicans are the ones that built your buildings. Yeah. Mexicans are the ones yeah. that cut your grass. Right, so get out there and cut my grass. <laughs> well, that's all we got today. Uh, have yourself a great day. Uh, be sure to tune in tomorrow for the uh, Thursday Double Double, of course, 3 p.m. Eastern on HTLA Radio 1, New York's best talk. And uh, check it out. It'll be more of me and Gilbert and, yes. and, and Louie, uh, not 
cluing into anything. It'd be great. <laughs> so you all have yourselves a great day. We'll catch you tomorrow.